This is Dr. Russell Blaylock, and you're listening to the Blaylock Health Channel. Today we're going to talk about heavy metals. One of the things I want to introduce this with is a friend of mine, Mike Adams, is uh, doing us all a great service. He started this forensic food lab. In this lab, he's doing some high-tech analysis of common foods, uh, supplements, cereals, in which he's looking at various heavy metals, light metals, various toxic metals, uh, arsenic, lead, mercury, iron content, copper, aluminum measuring these levels to show us just how much is in these different foods. He's also looking at a concept he has named metal capturing capacity. What this does is it measures the ability of these foods, the content in the foods, particularly flavonoids, to bind with these various metals, either holding on to them very avidly, and which could be an antitoxic process, or uh, being able to uh, release these metals once they're inside of the body. So this is a very important thing that he's doing. And I would encourage you to visit his website, the Forensic Food Labs, at naturalnews.com. First, we want to talk about mercury. Now, mercury is a ubiquitous metal. It's found all over the world. It's in the atmosphere. It's in the soil. It's found in many foods and various concentrations because some plants concentrate it more than others. There's basically three forms of mercury we need to be concerned with, and that is the organic mercury, things like methylmercury and ethylmercury, which are very uh, well absorbed and distributed throughout the body, particularly the brain. There's metallic mercury, which is poorly absorbed through the GI tract and very poorly absorbed across the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And the third form we need to be concerned about is the vapor form. Uh, Mercury tends to vaporize quite easily, and when it vaporizes, it can saturate the atmosphere. Studies have shown that the atmospheric mercury level can vary depending on things like coal burning. Coal is a source of mercury vapor. For instance, in West Texas, the uh, atmospheric concentration of mercury is quite high. And in the southern states, the mercury level generally tends to be rather high. And during hurricane season, when the hurricanes come through in the Gulf, uh, it tends to push this mercury vapor up north, and then it'll linger in the uh, northern states. So this can be a source of significant problems. Now, a lot of what we learned about mercury toxicity came from Iraq in 1971, in which they accidentally fed a large number of people bread that they made their uh, pizza-type bread out of, contained a very high amount of mercury. Something like 50,000 people were poisoned and over 5,000 died. And then in a period from 1932 to 1968, in Japan, in the Minamata Bay, they had a company there that was uh, dumping a mercury compound into the bay, and it was being converted into methyl mercury. The uh, seafood uh, in that bay had very high contents, and so tens of thousands of people were poisoned by this mercury. So we had a chance to study the pathology and the effect of this mercury on the brain in particular. Now, the organic mercuries are mainly absorbed orally, except when they're placed in vaccines as the marisol. Uh, Then it's injected directly into the muscle. Studies have shown, in which they did radio labeling, that this mercury is distributed throughout the body and concentrates particularly in the brain. And the atmospheric mercury tends to pass through the olfactory nerves, that is the smell nerves in the nose, pass through the olfactory tract directly into the limbic parts of the brain, particularly the entorhinal area and the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And these areas are very important for memory, learning, and behavior. One can absorb the mercury through the skin and through the cornea of the eye. They used to put mercury thimerosal in eye drops for various medications and for uh, the moistening of the eye. And this was rapidly absorbed through the cornea and produced toxicity. It can also be absorbed through the skin. Uh, in the past, there were cosmetic creams and lotions that contained a mercury compound, which was rapidly absorbed through the skin. And of course, as we're seeing with Mike Adams' studies, a number of foods contain some mercury, and these are mainly processed foods. And drugs contain mercury. For instance, the prescription drugs, uh, some of those have been shown to contain mercury compounds. And of course, the big worry is the illegal drugs, because these aren't tested at all, and these contain not only mercury, but a number of dangerous chemicals. 
In the past, one of the ways we discovered the toxic effect of mercury was that in the hatter industry, uh, when they would prepare the felt hats, they used a mercury compound for this hat production. And the people who did it, of course, used their bare hands and the mercury was absorbed. And people noticed these people tend to stumble around like they were intoxicated, and they tend to act rather bizarre and very strange behavior. And so they stuck to the term uh, mad as a hatter. Also, cinnabar miners, which is the basic element that mercury is extracted from, also were noted to have severe damage to their body from breathing this vapor and having it absorbed through their skin. They developed severe neurological problems. The one thing about mercury is it's stored in fat, and of course the brain is about 60% fat by dry weight, and so it absorbs a considerable amount of the mercury, and the mercury is stored there, so it's an accumulative toxin, which means that each small absorption every day is stored in the fat over time so that the levels continue arising. The heart tissue tends to absorb a considerable amount of mercury and has been closely linked to heart failure. Now, one of the unusual things about mercury is that it's a delayed toxicity. That is, people who have significantly high exposures to mercury may appear perfectly normal for several years, even up to five years before they finally develop severe toxicity. So there can be a very long period of delay. Many of the studies that were done on mercury, in fact, were short-term studies, and this falsely demonstrated that the mercury was not toxic when a longer-term study would have demonstrated it. The organic mercury can have the methyl group removed enzymatically and ethyl group, in the case of the marathol, the ethyl mercury, and it converts it to a metal inside of the body. This happens in the brain when the methyl mercury and ethyl mercury are absorbed into the brain, which they're very easily absorbed into the brain. They are changed into this metallic mercury, which is thought to be more toxic and more persisting, can persist for a lifetime. One of the uh, interesting studies on how uh, mercury damages the brain was done by Charles and co-workers, in which they used rhesus monkeys exposed to methylmercury. And what they found is even with relatively small concentrations of methylmercury, this compound accumulated in the astrocytes of the brain. Now, the astrocytes are the site of glutathione production for the brain, which is a very protective antioxidant, and it's the site where glutamate is regulated in the brain. Over time, the astrocytes begin to die off. This releases the glutamic acid, producing excitotoxicity toxicity in the brain long term. Also, with this demethylization process, the mercury was redistributed in the brains so that went to different areas that had profound effect on behavior, learning, and memory. They also found that the concentration of mercury that was toxic was much lower than they first thought. As they began to look at it, they found even sub-micromolar concentrations of mercury could cause this release of glutamate in the brain and intense excitotoxicity. It also causes the mitochondrion to malfunction. And as I said, uh, mercury is associated with heart failure. The higher the mercury level, the greater the incidence of heart failure. It also accumulates in the kidneys and associated with kidney damage. One of the greatest accumulations Accumulations, of course, is in the colon and liver. And this is because of the intrahepatic circulation uh, of mercury. That's how it's excreted, primarily by the colon, less so by the kidneys. And so the intestines become a site of damage by the colon, and the bacteria in the colon can change the mercury into a different form of mercury. As far as treatment of mercury toxicity, DMSA has been the standby, but a problem with that, it can be toxic. It does not remove mercury from the brain. It can cause a redistribution of the mercury that is changed from the subcutaneous fat or the fat in the body and distributed to the brain. Other ways to reduce mercury toxicity are alpha-lipoic acid, which in high doses tends to be an excellent way to reduce the toxicity of mercury and bind the mercury. Garlic is a very potent binder of mercury and enters the brain quite well. And the advantage of garlic is it can be taken all the time, particularly aged garlic extract. Magnesium has been shown to reduce brain mercury levels if taken over a very long period of time, which is a good thing to do anyway, and magnesium neutralizes things like fluoride and uh, other toxic substances as well. And one of the interesting ways to remove mercury from the body is by sweating. In the past, the cinnabar miners knew that if you would get in a steam bath, you could sweat out a lot of this mercury. So that's one of the forgotten ways to reduce the mercury content in the body. 
Now, one of the unseen problems uh, with mercury that a lot of people don't appreciate is that since mercury is fat soluble, if a person is obese, has a high content of mercury in their fat tissue, and they decide to lose weight. And so they go into this weight reduction program. As they begin to lose this fat weight, the mercury is released and then redistributed to the brain. So they end up doing sort of an auto intoxication with a sudden release of this mercury from that fat tissue. Now, there are some other things that we need to understand in relationship to these toxic metals. Primarily is that the concept of subclinical damage. What this means is that sometimes people are exposed to these toxic metals such as mercury, cadmium, lead, arsenic, and they don't appear to be having any particular problem where there's very subtle problems that they assume are just aging or uh, change of life or something like that. So we know that there's this subclinical toxicity in which changes are occurring in the mitochondrion, the cell function, the brain function that are so subtle they're not clinically picked up until much later. So this needs to be appreciated that this can occur. We also have things that are related to genetic susceptibility. Sometimes people have a genetic weakness for an environmental toxin. That is, they're affected more severely or develop certain syndromes that others would not be subject to. Other things that we do that are toxic, for instance, uh, alcohol abuse, smoking, exposure to other toxic metals and chemicals can add to the toxicity of the mercury or sometimes synergistically enhance the toxicity of the mercury, meaning that it'll be much more toxic in that situation. And that needs to be appreciated. Now, often people go to doctors with heavy metal toxicities that they're not aware of, and they complain of vague feelings of fatigue or cloudiness of their thought, memory lapses, irritability, depression, sometimes minor aches and pains, and it's put off by the doctor. They say, well, then you're just getting older, and that's something you have to expect. It could be due to stress, or you, for women, they say, well, you're going through menopause, and these things happen, so they just sort of brush it off. Unfortunately, one of the last things that's ever looked at is the possibility of metal toxicities. And most doctors are unfamiliar with the details of metal toxicities, and so they don't even consider it in their differential diagnosis. As a result, many of these patients are called uh, crocs or or they just tell them that they're chronically depressed and they'll shift them off to another physician or shift them off to a psychiatrist or write them a prescription for an antidepressant. Unfortunately, this happens quite often. Now, as far as testing, there's a number of tests that can be done. Uh, the hair testing has been shown to be fairly accurate. You have to follow the instructions of the company that's uh, doing the testing because it depends on where you take the hair whether close to the scalp or the tip uh, of the hair. And that determines whether it's an acute exposure or chronic exposure. Sometimes you can use toenail clippings. This is a good way to measure some of the metals because they are retained in the toenails for very long periods of time. The DMSA testing, you give a, a dose of DMSA, this pulls the mercury out of the tissues, particularly the fat tissues of the body, and that way you can measure urinary levels of the mercury. It's best to get a 24-hour urine specimen and see if uh, you have elevated mercury levels. As far as some of the newer treatments, some new compounds are being worked on to see if there's better ways and less toxic ways to remove these metals. One of the concepts we have is that of binding of the metal but not moving it or removing it. Basically, what that means is we found that if certain compounds, for instance, flavonoids, quercetin, and curcumin, will bind the mercury so tightly that even though it doesn't remove it, it reduces or eliminates the toxicity. We see this with a number of compounds, for instance, with fluoride. Calcium will bind the fluoride very avidly and prevent a great deal of the fluoride toxicity. So calcium fluoride is about a thousand times less toxic than is sodium fluoride. Magnesium also is one of the metals that tends to bind other metals and reduce their toxicity. So it's a good idea to take your magnesium on a regular basis. Therefore, it's not always necessary to remove these metals from the body. Sometimes you can utilize plant extracts to neutralize their toxicity even though they're not removed. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast, and next week's broadcast, I'll discuss some of the other metal toxicities, such as cadmium and lead and arsenic.
The information contained within these programs is not intended to replace or contradict that of your physician. This information is for educational purposes only. 